It is Wednesday, July 27th, 2022, and we are here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad that you're with us. We're glad that you've joined us tonight, and we would certainly invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We're returning to our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians. We've enjoyed those studies. Caleb has uh, done an excellent job, and Stuart has as well, filling in a little bit. So join us at 9.30 this coming Sunday morning in person person for that if you're able to do so, and then 1030 for worship as well. We're looking forward to getting back together this coming Lord's Day morning. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, feel free to give us a call or send an email, and the email address is fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. The phone number for the church is 608-224-0274. And again, if I don't know if I mentioned this before we left a few weeks ago, uh, but we are finally able to get text on that number again. That shut down for some reason back at the end of December where we were no longer able to get text. And it took literally days on hold with uh, tech support at Verizon and just getting the runaround here and there, trying all different kinds of ways to fix that problem. Uh, but anyway, it ultimately involved getting a, a new phone for me with uh, uh, two SIM cards. And so one of those SIM cards is for the church number. So we added a new plan in that way uh, for about the same price as the old plan in case you're curious about that. But uh, anyway, once again, we can get text on the church line again, which when we first had that capability a few years ago, I uh, wasn't really sure how much we would use it, but it has been a valuable resource. If you're familiar with texting, if you do any of that, you may uh, be aware of that and uh, just imagine having that with the church. It's just been a blessing. Uh, we were able to use it just, I think, yesterday. We got a call from somebody from uh, the Indianapolis area who hopes to visit with us in a week or two. And he said, can you please text me back? And so um, obviously that's a lot quicker in some ways. He could answer that on his own time. And I was able to do that with the church line. So anyway, I'm thankful that we are uh, up and running with texting on the church line. Feel free to give that a test. If you want to text me in that way, go for it. I'd love to hear from you in that way. Before we get to our study of the Bible tonight, we've got an addition to our calendar, and uh, this is good news for us. Gary Mueller has arranged for us to go pontooning again, and I'm not sure whether pontooning is a word. It is now, at least for me, but uh, this is something we did several years ago. We had a great time doing it. And the date for this is Sunday, August 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. And Gary will have more information for us in the very near future in terms of where we meet and that kind of thing. Uh, but he'll have a sign-up sheet at church on Sunday. We have a limit of 12 people per pontoon. We've got two of those reserved. So please see Gary if you have any questions about that. Give him a call or a text to get on that list if you're uh, not able to be at the building to sign up for that. But I'm looking forward to this, and we're hoping for good weather and a good time of good Christian fellowship, just being together, and uh, certainly we need more of that, and uh, being able to do that outside is just an amazing blessing. We live in a great place, and uh, a lot of places to explore on the Four Lakes here in the Madison area. Well, tonight we get back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. And over the past three weeks, when I've been away in Florida, we took some time to look at the Great Flood in much greater detail, I guess with a guest speaker, we might say, with some videos from World Video Bible School. With their permission, we were able to uh, send out those links and get those shared. Uh, but those lessons were presented by Branyan May. He is a scientist with a Ph.D., and I believe he's worked for NASA at some point in the past, just a, a brilliant man. And I think he did a very good job with some of the questions that we might have had about Noah and the ark and the animals on the ark and all that. And I hope those lessons were helpful. It was interesting to me to see some of the comparisons that he made looking at that from a scientific point of view. And he actually made a series of four lessons on the Great Flood, if I remember correctly. We only looked at the first three of those, so we might get back to the fourth one at some point in the future, or you may simply want to look ahead at that one on your own time. Uh, tonight, though, we're picking up with Genesis chapter 11. So up to this point, over the past few months, we've looked at the creation, we've looked at the fall, We've looked at the flood in terms of big events that we've studied so far in the book of Genesis. We, we had the list of nations in uh, Genesis chapter 10. It was almost like a genealogy, but it really wasn't uh, this person begat this person who begat this person kind of thing. It was more of a list, I think, of 70 nations, if I remember correctly, and kind of how they got to where they were going. And uh, so this is in the previous chapter, chapter 10, explaining how various people ended up in different places. So that was chapter 10. So tonight we're picking up with Genesis chapter 11. And 
Our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I hope you can see it on the screen or on your device or your television in the living room or however you're watching class tonight. If you're just listening on the phone, we are very glad that you're here. So obviously you may want to have a, a Bible of your own in front of you. But this is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. This is our first paragraph tonight. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 4. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Looking back at verse 1, let's realize that this must have taken place in time sequence at some point before Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. If you have your Bible open, you may want to just skim back there briefly, but notice in Genesis 10, verse 5 in the previous chapter, in giving a history of the nations as they developed after the flood, uh, Moses speaks of the sons of Javon, and he says, from these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And so just putting this into context then in verse 1, uh, everybody is still using the same language here. So obviously this is not in chronological order. And the events of Genesis chapter 11 must get inserted back into Genesis 10 at some point if we were to arrange all of this in chronological order. So just wanted to uh, point that out before we get into this. It's a little bit like Genesis chapter 2 uh, being a little bit more detail into some of the days in Genesis chapter 1, if that makes sense. So anyway, up in verse 2, we find that the descendants of Noah, they are moving east. And uh, if we were together, I might ask, you know, why are they moving east? And it seems to me that they're moving for a reason. So they are spreading out. If you remember back in Genesis 9-1, immediately after the flood, uh, God had said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so the command then is to fill the earth. They are to move out. They are not to stay in one place, but they are to go out there to fill the whole world. Um, and obviously they can't fill the whole earth if they stay in one spot. So they are in the process of multiplying and moving and some of them move in an easterly direction. However, at some point in this process, um, when at least one group gets to this plain in the land of Shinar, they settle there. In other words, they stop. And so instead of filling the earth, instead of traveling and continuing to travel out in all directions, they stay put. And so even right here at the beginning of this paragraph, it seems that the people are very clearly disobeying God's command to fill the earth. Now, whether that's the, the main issue here remains to be seen. I think that'll clarify for us over the next several verses, but this certainly seems to be at least a part of it. Uh, Shinar, by the way, is mentioned in Genesis 10, verses 8 through 10, with a reference to Nimrod. Remember, he was a one of the big characters back in the previous chapter. I know it's been almost a month since we've been in that chapter. Um, but uh, back in Genesis 10, starting in verse 8, Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So that's the reason why I read those verses with the reference to Shinar. So it's possible that the incident here in Genesis 11 uh, actually takes place during the days of Nimrod, or at least among his descendants. So I wanted to make that connection between chapter 10 and chapter 11. Uh, on the plain of Shinar, they, can, they decide to build a city and a tower. I know a lot of times we focus on the tower, and that's uh, the more... Uh, that's the that's the thing that's easiest to illustrate here, but let's not forget they were building a city as well, and that kind of feeds into this problem of them staying put instead of moving. You don't build cities if you're on the on the move. But here they decide to build a city, also a tower, and they build this tower not using stone as they might have previously uh, done if they were building, you know, using stones or something like that earlier in world history, but they burn bricks. And they use tar for mortar. And so there's some kind of technological advancement that's made here. Instead of just using randomly shaped stones, uh, they now have uniform bricks. And they're not just sun-dried bricks either, but they are uh, bricks that are fired. And so they are cooked with high heat, making them, of course, stronger. 
and allowing them to be more efficient in the building of buildings and especially this this tower certainly would allow it to uh, get a lot larger than it would have been previously with stones uh, in verse 4 we see their motivation and I think this is where we get a little more clarity here when I was a kid I kind of thought the problem was they were trying to reach God with the tower I mean there is the reference to it reaching into heaven but that's not specifically uh, called out as their motivation in other words it doesn't say they built a tower so that they could get to God uh, getting you know it was a, a tower that went up to heaven but that was not necessarily why they built it so looking at the actual text that's really uh, not the issue here the tower will reach into heaven uh, but not for the purpose of reaching God their goal first of all is to make for themselves a name isn't it isn't that what Moses points out here they are making themselves a name in other words they're trying to get famous and we have a lot of people today trying to get famous, don't we? That seems to be a motivation online with the social media and all that. I want to do some, some stupid thing so everybody looks at me and so nobody will forget my name for the rest of their lives kind of thing. And so they're trying to get famous here in this passage. Uh, secondly, it seems that they want to rally around this tower to keep them from scattering over the whole earth, over all the face of the earth. And so instead of filling the earth, as God had commanded, it seems their purpose here is to stay put. And so as they travel, they find this great place to settle. This is in the Fertile Crescent, Iraq or Iran, over in that part of the world. You know, look, we can do crops here. This is a great place. Instead of continuing on as God has told us to do, let's just let's just drop it right here. Let's just do this thing right here and, uh, and never move from this place. And so they are building a tower as something of a gathering place. If we build this ginormous tower, uh, it'll be something of a monument and it'll keep us all together it'll attract us all to the same spot and obviously that is the exact opposite of what god had commanded them to do well let's continue tonight with genesis 11 verses 5 through 9 the next paragraph here genesis chapter 11 verses 5 through 9 the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built the lord said behold they are one people and they all have the same language and this is what they began to do and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them come let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech so the lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city therefore its name was called babel because there the lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there the lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth in verse 5 it seems to me as if god through moses is being ever so slightly humorous i don't know if you catch that there if that's just me reading too much into that maybe a little bit sarcastic i don't know if that's it or not but i'm just pointing that out as a possibility but just notice how god is described as observing this tower it's this tower reaching up to heaven but notice what the lord has to do to see it the lord is described as coming down to see it <laughs> so uh, maybe humor is not the intent here but uh, i get the picture in my mind of a kid uh stopping and stooping down to look at an anthill you know the, the the hill must seem so impressive to the ants this is a huge thing to them uh, but to a human obviously an anthill is almost nothing we have to stoop down uh, to look at it and I would say maybe in the same way, this tower must have seemed huge. I mean, especially they are in the plains of Shinar. So think about being in the middle of Nebraska and seeing this huge, just massive tower sprouting up in the middle of the plains. And so that's the idea here. So that we've got this huge tower, you know, in my mind, you think about the, the Sears Tower. It'll always be the Sears Tower in my mind. But that is so impressive to us as human beings. What an amazing building. And and yet, even with a structure like that, God has to kind of stoop down to look at it. So almost insulting to the people who were so impressed with themselves. So God comes down uh, to observe this ginormous tower. Uh, the Lord's concern in verse 6 is that the people, if they continue, will do pretty much anything. And as I understand it, the real concern isn't just that they may do anything, but the concern is they are doing anything but filling the earth so the people are uniting uh, in order to avoid doing what god had commanded them to do and as i understand this god is concerned if this keeps up uh, it'll just get right back to where we were under the days of noah leading up to the flood and, and that kind of thing so that seems to be his concern they are uniting together to do what god has uh, in a sense forbidden them from doing they are not spreading out as he wanted them to do so in verse 7 
Uh, God speaks to himself again. Um, kind of a strange reference if you're not familiar with this, but we've seen this previously in Genesis 126, where God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And we see it again here. We seem to have uh, multiple uh, personalities within the Godhead. If that's, it's even hard to describe in those terms. Uh, we worship one God. There are three distinct parts of God, even that's not the, the most accurate way of describing this. Um, of course, with further revelation, we now today would refer to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, but there is this conversation that takes place within the Godhead. God refers to himself as us. So, you know, we, we talk to ourselves kind of thing. And uh, God decides among himself to confuse their language. So this is his solution to the problem. Now, for just a moment, I would invite you to think about what your job would look like if everyone at work suddenly started speaking different languages. You may say, we're already speaking different languages at my work, but uh, just imagine if you go into work in the morning to accomplish a mission and you're all speaking the same language. Work is hard enough all on the same page, but imagine halfway through the workday, every single person uh, breaks out in some unknown language. <laughs> what a, what confusion that would bring into, uh, into that scenario. And imagine what would be accomplished if that were to happen. Nothing. I mean, it would all shut down immediately without that communication between each other. Or maybe we could imagine a huge construction site where that happens. You're all working together to build this building and got carpenters, electricians, plumbers, and suddenly nobody can talk to each other. It would be absolute chaos on the job site. And that's exactly what happens here. And uh, not only does work on the tower stop, uh, but God accomplishes his mission of forcing the people to keep scattering. And I would imagine that as soon as this happens, people would very quickly start teaming up with those who spoke the same language. You'd start, you'd start listening. Oh, I, I have something in common with this guy over here, so I'm going to go over here with him. And then you'd start finding other people who spoke that same language and so on. And so, in other words, if God made a hundred different languages, people would very quickly separate into a hundred different groups uh, based on those language groups. And these people then scatter from there, so they then head out in all different directions. Notice in verse 9, the place is named Babel, uh, meaning confusion, because it was there that the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And that leads me to one of my uh, favorite memes of all time. I don't always share memes in a Bible class. Um, I just discovered this one a year or two ago, and I filed it away under Genesis 11 and just said to myself, I am looking forward to sharing this if we ever get to Genesis chapter 11 again. And I guess I should explain this to those of you who are joining us on the phone tonight. It's an image of the Tower of Babel, and it says, uh, that's a nice tower you got there. Be a shame if somebody... And then it switches to something that looks a little bit like Greek. So uh, uh, pretty funny. I hope you guys are laughing with me and not at me on this. But uh, I love this, and I think it illustrates God's creativity in solving this problem. Remember, he said, I'll never flood the earth again. I'll never you know, kill everybody on earth with a flood. So I think... That little conference, they get together and they're like, okay, well, option one is off the table. <laughs> what, are, what are we going to do next? Uh, let's try this and let's uh, confuse their language. So instead of killing everybody, instead of some other kind of punishment, God simply confuses their language. And uh, very creatively, uh, creatively um, God solves this problem. So comes up with a brand new solution and works through this. And so they stop building. And immediately they spread out in all directions, just as God had uh, originally commanded. Um, the artwork in this meme, by the way, was created by Peter Bruegel, the elder, uh, back in 1563. So I'm pretty sure the copyright has expired on that one. So if uh, Peter the elder wants to uh, sue the Four Lakes congregation for sharing his artwork, uh, I will uh, look forward to, uh, to meeting him. Uh, this is another artist rendition of the Tower of Babel, this one from Athanasius Kircher. And this one comes from the mid-1600s, so again, way back when. We've got a lot of modern renditions of the Tower, but uh, these are some that we can share that are out from under a copyright law. Uh, this one is from Gustave Doré from the mid-1800s. Um, and we don't know exactly what the Tower of Babel looked like. Um, you know, we do have some remnants of several towers in that part of the world, don't we? Uh, they are known as ziggurats, and I would describe those as kind of low-stepped pyramids, kind of a uh, little bit like uh, pixelated pyramids <laughs> is the way I would think about that. 
Uh, but that's kind of what we've seen in some of these drawings. These, some of these have looked a little bit too much like some medieval kind of tower. Uh, but I would think back to some of those uh, ancient towers that we still find today in Iraq and Iran. You may remember Saddam Hussein parked his uh, a couple of his fighter planes, might have been his two fighter planes, uh, next to one of those ziggurats because it was like this you know, historical site and knew that we wouldn't bomb those in, back in the 90s or whatever. And so we have seen some of those on the news, but these are some uh, later drawings I think we might say. Oh, by the way, if this is where the human race is divided by language... Can you think of a time when the human race was reunited by language? When did we come back together in language? You know, I'm thinking of Acts chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, where Luke says this, And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why, are, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Isn't that an amazing thing? If God had the power to divide everybody by language, certainly he absolutely had the same power to reunite people uh, by language at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Uh, this seems to have been predicted by Zephaniah. In Zephaniah 3, verses 9 and 10, where God says through the prophet, For then I will give to the people's purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. And to me, it's just interesting that language was the first barrier God overcame in the establishment of his church. And so, in a sense, at least, that curse was lifted, at least briefly, as the church got off the ground. In terms of a practical application of what happens with the Tower of Babel, I would suggest that uh, we rededicate ourselves to including God in our plans. That really seems to be the issue here. They went to build this huge tower without considering God in the process. In fact, they were disobeying his word, weren't they, by not spreading out. And so they came together in defiance of God's will, and they refused to consider God in this process. I'm thinking of James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 where James says, come you, or come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So that would certainly be something to keep in mind, something that's practical from this passage. They did not consider God in their huge plans, and that absolutely got them into trouble. And we see that uh, throughout the judges and the kings of Israel, don't we? Um, often when a king would go to God and, you know, dear God, what do we do here? Things would go well. But if a king went into battle without consulting God, that's when they got into trouble. And it got them into trouble at Babel, and it'll get us into trouble today as well. Well, let's pick up tonight with Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 25. And uh, this is getting back to a huge list of names. So we will run through these fairly quickly. Now, I don't think a whole lot of practical lessons here. It's just getting us from one place to another. Well, let's look at Genesis 11, verses 10 through 25. These are the records of the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and became the father of Arkpakshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of Arkpakshad. And he had other sons and daughters. Arkpakshad lived 35 years and became the father of Shelah. And Arkpakshad lived 403 years after he became the father of Shelah. And he had other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 30 years and became the father of Eber. And Shelah lived 403 years after he became the father of Eber, and he had other sons and daughters. 
Eber lived 34 years and became the father of Peleg, and Eber lived 430 years after he became the father of Peleg, and he had other sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and became the father of Ru, and Peleg lived 209 years after he became the father of Ru, and he had other sons and daughters. Ru lived, lived 32 years and became the father of Serug, and Ru lived 207 years after he became the father of Serug, and he had other sons and daughters. Serug lived 30 years and became the father of Nahor, and Serug lived 200 years after he became the father of Nahor, and he had other sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah, and Nahor lived 119 years after he became the father of Terah, and he had other sons and daughters. Well, in this paragraph, obviously, we move rather quickly through that. We've got a list of the descendants of Shem, so one of Noah's three sons. Uh, not a whole lot of action in this paragraph in terms of amazing lessons to learn from, you know, bold deeds or whatever. Uh, but the main point, it seems, is to get us to Terah. So let's continue on and let's notice why this guy named Terah is so important to us. So let's pick up with Genesis 11, 26 through 32. Genesis 11, 26 through the end of the chapter. And let's notice what happens with Terah. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. In verse 26, notice we find Terah becomes the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is where we are introduced to Abram for the very first time, later known as Abraham, the father of the faithful, one of the most important characters anywhere in Scripture. And so this is where Abram pops on the scene for the very first time. Uh, notice we also have a reference to Lot in this passage, and it explains a lot, so to speak. I hope you'll forgive me for that one. Uh, notice in verse 27, uh, Lot's father is Haran, and in verse 28, we find that Haran dies in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans, and that seems to explain why Abram seems to be something of a mentor to Lot. Um, Lot's father has died, and so Abram, as his uncle, kind of steps in, uh, maybe to help fill that role and to take care of him, maybe provide some leadership and to bring him up along the way. In verse 29, we're introduced to Sarai for the very first time, also later known as Sarah. And we also learn in verse 30 that Sarai was barren, that she had no children. And this will obviously be very significant here in a few chapters. Uh, we also learn in this passage that Terah is the one who makes the first move toward Canaan uh, by moving Abram, his son, Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and Lot, his grandson, toward Canaan, uh, settling in Haran along the way. Terah... Uh, however, never makes it to Canaan, but he dies in Haran, uh, never gets all the way there. We don't really know why he made that move at this point. It seems later that Abraham was the motivator here and that uh, Terah kind of went along with it. But anyway, we'll get back to that here in a week or two. Uh, but this sets us up for what happens next with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. And so that leads into next week's class. I hope you can be with us a week from tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, tonight we've seen the beginning of the story of Abram one of the greatest men anywhere in the Bible. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for our study of 2 Thessalonians and then at 10.30 uh, for our worship assembly. What a great group we had on Sunday. Just a, a good attitude, it seemed, among the congregation. People seemed happy to be together. Um, at, at least that's the, the impression I got. I, I don't think you were all faking that on Sunday, but it just seemed like a good group, a good number of visitors, and uh, it was just great to be together and uh, good to do some uh, fellowship after, after service. So I want to see you this coming Sunday again, if at all possible. And uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of all the earth, King of all nations. 
You are a God who communicates clearly, and to you, language is no barrier. Thank you for giving us your word, and tonight we're so thankful that you've allowed us to have access to your word in our own language. Many do not yet have this great blessing, and we pray for the ongoing efforts that are being made to make this possible. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your eternal kingdom, the church, and thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight as a congregation. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, and our King. Amen.